I got it. All right, everyone, let's find a seat and we'll go ahead and begin. And I want to welcome everyone to the services tonight. Glad to have you here. And uh, looking forward to what the Lord's going to do tonight. We'll have the message first, and after that, then we'll, we'll have the time for prayer requests. And so let's have a word of prayer, and, uh, and we'll begin. All right, we'll sing some songs. And so let's pray. Heavenly Father, I sure do thank you, Lord, for the beautiful day, the cooler weather. And we just appreciate how you care for us, Lord. And we thank you for your provision. And I pray that, Lord, as we meet together to gather around your word, you'll bless our time of study and you'll bless our time of prayer, and you'll bless the time of teaching in the back with our children. Lord, we love you tonight, and we thank you for Jesus above all else, and we ask it all in his precious name. Amen. 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 All right, I'm going to reverse the order. Let's sing number 355 first. 355. What a friend we have in Jesus. If you want to stand, you stand, all right? And if you prefer to sit, you help yourself. Sing from your heart. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrow share Jesus knows our every weakness take it to the Lord in prayer are we weak and heavy laden Cumbered with a load of care. Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee. Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou wilt find a solace there. Amen. He really is the brother, or he really is the friend that sticketh closer than a brother, isn't he? Amen. Through thick and thin. Number 250. Number 250. 250. Boy, this is a great truth right here. Days are filled with sorrow and care. Hearts are lonely and drear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted. 
erected at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Cast your care on Jesus today. Leave your worry and fear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Troubled soul, the Savior can see every heartache and fear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Amen. Thank you for the good singing and playing tonight. All right, pirates, y'all are excused. You can walk the plank. All right. That's good. I appreciate what the ladies do in the back with the kids. Amen. And, uh, and so you pray for them that that word that they're teaching, that it will take root take root in their hearts. Amen. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles tonight before we take our, our we're, we're good, brother. Thank you. Uh, I'd like you to turn in your Bibles tonight to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. To, uh, who was it that, uh, I guess it was Brian that taught me, let me see, it was called, uh, was it Jepco? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, or that Gentiles eat pork chops, all right? So you can find the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 3, and uh, I want to be an encouragement to you tonight and, uh, and give you some practical things, I think, that will help us during the week, each day of our life, if we will but apply them. Colossians chapter 3. And I want you to find your place in verse 1. Colossians chapter 3 in verse 1. And thank you for praying for me. Study was easy, and I appreciate that. And, uh, and so let's look at these passages, all right? Colossians chapter 3, look in verse 1 with me. He said, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Aren't you glad to know that's where he is, amen? That the Bible says he ever liveth to make intercession for us. What a blessing that we have a high priest and we have a throne of grace that we can go to. And, uh, and so verse 2, set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. You know, because really there's nothing down here but a lot of times but disappointment. Things are not eternal. Things are temporary. And, uh, and really, they, they really don't have any lasting impact. You know, when you, when you get born again and you have a biblical view of the world, you really see how temporary all of this is. I, you probably remember this would be before your time, brother, and before your sister. But it used to be, you know what they say, go for the gusto. You know, because you had to have it all right now because there was nothing to look forward to. But I thank God when you get born again, man, there is something to look forward to. There's a place where we're headed. And so set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth. For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ. Now what? With Christ in God. And look at verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear... 
then shall you also appear with him in glory. And I want to encourage you tonight about setting your sights, if you will, on things above. Things above. You know, because when we look around uh, down here, it can be frustrating. It can be discouraging, particularly in the light. Man, you know, I'll just tell you, I I'm tired of all the political jargon, aren't you? <laughs> you know, uh... Uh, you know, I'm just ready for some regular news without, without somebody slandering somebody or accusing them of something or whatever. But, but anyway, I, I want to talk to you about looking above tonight, things above. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for the precious word, words of encouragement, Lord, that Paul was giving to this church. And I pray, Lord, that uh, by way of, of the Holy Spirit, Lord, that by mixing what we hear tonight with faith, that God, this word that no doubt encouraged them will encourage us. And so I pray, Father, your will be done now. Help your servant, Lord, to help these dear saints. Thank you, Lord, for their faithfulness. And I pray, God, you'll touch them. And the ladies in the back as they work with our children, Lord. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, Christ really is the answer. You know, I didn't know that as a lost man, that Christ was the answer to a lot of the problems, the ills, and uh, the problems, the discouragements of this life. And there are many because, you know, life can be hard. Life is not fair. We, we, we understand those things. Some of you have lived long enough. You've been through some discouragement and disappointments in your life. If you can get through life without having a scar on you from some of those things, you've done well. Amen. You've done well. And, but Christ really is the answer. And you know, the world tries to come up with the answer, don't they? The psychologist says, well, look within yourself. That's what they always want you to do. Examine yourself and muddle all these things over and, uh, and look within yourself for, the, for, uh, for your help. The opportunist says, you need to look around. You need to be looking for opportunities. The optimist says, hey, you better look ahead, look ahead, boy, look what's on the horizon. The pessimist said, no, you better look out. Because <laughs> trouble's right around the corner, right? Their, their cup is always half empty, and their loaf is, it's a half a loaf, half gone. But the Lord says, look up and see him. Notice what he said. If he then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. I'm not looking for him around here. I want to be looking up where he is. And so here in these passages, he's going to give us three things. He's going to tell us what to seek. He's going to talk to us about how to seek and then why we should do it. Why should we seek these things? So let me give you the first one, what to seek. Well, very plainly right there in verse 1, it talks about seeking Christ. Seeking Christ. If you then be risen with him, risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. And so really, beloved, he needs to be the object of our attention, the object of our affections. Notice how he said that in verse 2, set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. Now if you go back with me. Let's go back to the Old Testament for just a few minutes. And I'll just, you don't have to turn there. I'm, I'm just going to give you this little bit. It'll refresh your memory. You remember what happened on the, when they had that very first Passover, don't you? What did, what, did, what did the Lord tell Moses to do? Man, get you a lamb for every household, and I want you to take that lamb, and I want you to take that blood and put it on the lintels, and that, that's that part up there, and the doorposts, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And, uh, but were they done with the lamb? No, that wasn't all they were supposed to do. Beloved, they were then supposed to take that lamb from the head to the tail, if you will, the legs included and all the pertinence. And what were they supposed to do? They were supposed to roast that lamb. It was to be eaten and it wasn't to be boiled. It was to be eaten and cooked, if you will, for them to feast upon. And they had to feast on the whole thing. He said, whatever's left over, you've got to burn it with fire. He didn't want anything left over over from that lamb. Now we put a great deal of emphasis on the blood, don't we? And shouldn't we? Amen. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Thank God for the blood that was shed on Calvary's cross. Amen. 
But beloved, that's only the part of it. That's only the first part of the journey. You think about it, you know, they had the blood to save them from death, but they had to feed on the lamb so they would have strength for the journey. And beloved, we who've been saved, we've already had the application of the blood. And now we need to feed on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, and were they supposed to, they were supposed to eat the whole thing, right? I think about that being both Lord and Master. He's not one without the other. You know, he's, he's Lord of all or he's not Lord at all, right? And so that goes together. And so feeding on him, feeding on him, what a difference that makes. We need that for the strength of our journey because aren't we pilgrims and strangers down here? We are, and we need that spiritual food that only he can provide to sustain us and that new life on the inside. So we got to feed on the Lord if we're going to follow him faithfully. There can be no leftovers for the Christian. We have to have it all. They couldn't, remember, they couldn't live on the leeks and garlics. When they got out there, they had to have the manna. That's who he is. He's the manna that came down. Didn't he say, I'm the bread from heaven? They had to have it all. And they needed that for the strength of their journey. And beloved, we need that as well. He needs to be the focus, if you will, telling us what should we seek when we think about those things that are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of the Father. It is him. It is him that we ought to seek after. I mean, you know, really, we ought to keep him, you know, we ought to keep the main thing, the main thing in this life and not lose our focus and not lose our center on these things. You want strength for the journey to handle the disappointments sometimes that comes in life, the bumps in the road, if you will, that come in life. Oh, we need to feast upon him and have some every day. Have some every day. Spurgeon said this. He said, there are times... When we just need solitude and we don't need all the social carrying on, sometimes that happens. What, what, what does he mean by that? He said that we should be better Christians if we were more alone, waiting upon God and gathering from him through meditation on some things. You know, I know you all know about cattle. How many stomachs do they have? Four. Four, all right. I, I, did not, I wasn't exactly sure, all right? They have four. And you think about that. You know what that tells me about? That tells me that, uh, that they have got the mechanism to extract everything out of every little bit of that grass. I mean, only God could come up with it that a brown cow could eat green grass and give white milk. Amen, you know, and it, and it takes all four of those, it takes all four of those, studies. What, what do we call that when they, what, when they chew the cud? What are they doing? Is that fresh? No, that's something they already chewed. That's something they already partially digested. And then while they're sitting out there, they get some mechanism or whatever. They say, you know, I don't think I got everything out of that. And they, and they get it up there and they start chewing on it again. They're going to extract every little bit of nutrition out of that grass or whatever it is that you're giving them. And you think sometimes, listen, you know, Usually Sundays, isn't it so at your house? Usually Sundays is when you have that nice meal. Don't you try to have that? Maybe family comes over and you've gone a little extra. Maybe you've got rolls and you've got mashed potatoes and gravy. You've got a few things to go there. Why? Because it's your Sunday dinner. And, and, and you really, you know, and the rest of the time, what are we doing? Man, we got something in the microwave. We got ramen noodles. And, uh, you know, we're popping it here. And, man, I'll just eat a hot dog. I mean, I, I thought I had put something in the refrigerator. I thought I'd put something away. And I said, man, I guess I'll just eat a couple of hot dogs. I had a couple of them Nathan hot dogs. I just, I just nuked them. You know, that's what I call it when you put it in the microwave. You just nuke them. And all right, and then when they were hot enough, I put a slice of cheese on there, put some ketchup on it, ate that down. And, man, out the door I was. And I was back to doing whatever I was doing before I, I sat down to eat. But I didn't really, brother, I didn't really enjoy it I didn't savor it because it went by so fast and you know sometimes aren't we guilty of that I want to read my Bible you know I want to be faithful I want to read something so we rush oh I'm just going to read that one verse boy buried with him in baptism what a blessing that was okay let's get out the door and go 
you're not really chewing on the cud. And Spurgeon said we'd be better off, we would be stronger Christians if we could learn how to extract everything out of those passages the time that we spend sometimes it's not the quantity but the quality you know and I, I think it's great to read your bible through in a year but sometimes it goes so fast you you miss some of the things isn't that so you know, when I was a kid, I always wanted to stop at everything, man. It seemed like when we'd go on a trip, I'd see all those signs, see Rock City. Hey, dig for rubies. And I'd be like, hey, Dad, can we, you know, man, we just pressed on. We stopped when the fuel gauge got down. And you better time your bathroom stops to the gas tank, amen? Because we had some place to be, and we didn't have time to smell the flowers. Didn't have time to see Rock City. Don't do that with your, don't do that, beloved, with your fellowship with the Lord. You know, when you were, when you were dating, how long did you spend at her door saying goodbye? Can you remember back that far? How long, how long did you do that? Man, I, you know, sometimes you'd be out there, you know, you had to have her home by a certain time. She had to be home for curfew. Well, I had her home, but I kept her outside for another 45 minutes. I wanted to extract everything I could out of that evening because it was hard to say goodnight. And beloved, just think about that in our relationship with him. The things above. How important that is. Let, let me just give this little illustration. There was a there was a very wealthy, a very wealthy prince, and he had a fiance, and man, he, he wanted to do something special for her. And so he has a gift that he gathers for her, and it's all wrapped up beautifully, and he presents it to her, and she just sees that beautiful bow and all the all that looks like all the trouble he'd gone to to get it wrapped and so lovely and everything. And he told her that it was priceless. That she was going to enjoy this. And she, man, she hurriedly got that off and opened it up. And it was a box. And in that box, when she opened it up, there nested in some velvet was an old iron egg. And sister, that's exactly what she did. <laughs> she went, this, this is the priceless thing? And she picked it up out of there and... And she was looking it over, and as she handled it, she, she ran her fingers across something she wasn't sure, but as she touched it, boop, and the lid opened up. And inside that old iron egg, there was a brass egg. And she dumped that iron egg over, and out came the brass egg. And she's holding on to that, and she's wondering, you know, is there something on this one? And, and she began to reach around, and she was trying to, the sides were so smooth, and she must have run over something. There went the lid on that one, and it opened up, and inside of there, there was a silver egg. A little bit smaller, but it, a silver egg, and it fit down inside, and so she dumped that one over with anticipation. Now she's got it together. Boy, she's running her hands over that, and she finds it, boom, opens it up, and there is a gold egg on the inside, and man, she thinks, I, I, I see why this is so precious. And as she's looking at it, admiring it, and, and gratitude in her heart, she rubs it, and all of a sudden that golden egg opens. And on the inside, nestled in there, inside that golden eggs, inside that golden eggs is just a little cluster of diamonds that are on the inside. With each touch, you see, that she went a little deeper, something became a little more valuable. Now you think about your relationship with him. You remember when you just had the touch of faith? What did you get with that? You got salvation, didn't you? You got a redeemer. Didn't look like much on the outside. Calvary's not a beautiful place. Remember, it's a bloody place. It was a place of death. But just one touch of faith. Didn't have to be great faith. It was just faith, believing what God said about his son and what he said about us. And your faith, man, opens that up. And there was salvation 
on the inside. And then look, you think about a little bit later on, another touch, sometimes a touch that includes patience or trust when you're going through a trial. And what did you find? You found there was grace. You found there was sympathy from him, that there was comfort from him in your sorrow. And even, you know, even love in those times, fellowship of comfort and mercy. He is the father of, uh, he is the God of all comfort and the Father of mercy. Amen. And all it took was a touch. You think about, remember that woman that was taken with the issue of blood? But w what did she do? All she touched was the hem of his garment. And look at all she got with just one touch. You think about over the course of your lifetime, if you're seeking him in those moments when discouragements came, and you just looked to him, and you trusted him, and you loved him, even when you didn't understand necessarily of why it was happening. It opened the doors to some things. Because, beloved, doesn't it say without faith it's impossible to please him? But he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently what? Seek him. Seek him, and that's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about, seeking the things that are above. We're talking about seeking him. So not only Christ, but beloved, there ought to be also some Christ-likeness. Look in verse 3 with me. He said, for ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. All right? Our lives are hid. You think about it with me. Didn't the resurrection change everything? And it's almost like, it's almost like, you know, we, we know a good bit about the blood and we thank God for that. But I don't know that we understand everything about feasting on the Lord. And at the same time, I know that we understand some things about Calvary, don't we? But I'm not sure that we really comprehend everything they, uh, that we ought to about the empty tomb. The resurrection. That's why he said here, for ye are dead. That's the Calvary part. And your life is hid with Christ in God. And that is the resurrection life that's on the inside, beloved. These are the things. Listen, we're dead and our life is hid. You know, we typically, we know more about the crucifixion than we do about the resurrection. That's why Paul said that I may know him. And the power of his resurrection. You know, to have more of that in my life. He said, in the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. And so as we come to grips, these are the things that we should be setting our, our sights on. What we're seeking after. To know more about those things. Dr. James Grigger is a friend of mine, missionary, longtime missionary in Austria and Liechtenstein. He said this, he said, we must believe that what we are not, we may become. Did you get that? We must believe what we are not, we may become. And the things that we are or what we are, we need not be. That's a powerful statement. When we believe that what we are not, you think about everything that he is that we aren't. <laughs> and we struggle with the, we struggle with the is, don't we? Don't we struggle with this old life, this old nature? We do. And what we are not, beloved, we may be. I, you know, I, I wonder if that goes through the caterpillar's mind. You know, you see him crawling around here, inching his way along, inching his way along till some point in time. I don't know what tells him. I don't, you know, if you want to say it's instinct, I very well could be. I just know God made them. And they get up there and they find a branch suitable or whatever they want to get on. They quit inching along. And next thing you know, man, they, they, they start and they start working on, the, they get in a cocoon, don't they? And you see them out there, and suddenly, you know, then what happens? Eventually, over the process of time, there's a transformation that takes place. And then they become that what? That butterfly. 
And they're not made, butterflies aren't made for scratching around and crawling around like an inchworm. Butterflies made to fly, isn't he? That's like us. What that caterpillar was not, he became in time. You understand? That's where we are, beloved. And he can help us with that if we understand more about that resurrection life. So we've been made partakers of the divine nature. And when we seek after the heavenly things, it really does make a difference. It really can elevate our walk if we keep our sights a little higher. Because like gravity, the stuff that goes on down here is always pulling us down, isn't it? Amen. I mean, just every day, it's one thing or another. Always pulling us down, always trying to... Just always just try to take the joy out of things. And, uh, and the Lord is so faithful in spite of that. He's given us everything that we need for the journey. And so that's the first thing. So what are we to seek? We ought to be seeking after Christ and after Christ likeness. And that comes through the power of the resurrection. Knowing more about that. Learning more about that. Number two, how do we seek? How do we seek these things? Look in verse two. This is how we do it. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. Now think about it. Now what, we're, what I'm talking about here is how do we practice this stuff? That all sounds good on paper, Brother Ed. That sounds good, but how do I do this? Remember what Paul said? Uh, you know, I want to do right, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Well, there's a way he's given us. He's got a little more information by the time he writes the book of Colossians. And one of those things is, is that we must set our affections on things above. So here, here, here's what I've learned in my own life and, and, and uh, in the lives of others. Typically, who or what a person loves controls them. Who or what a person loves controls them. Man, I, I you know, before I got saved, you know, I think back and man, Debbie was a weekend widow. When, uh, when I got the time off, you know, I raised my dogs. I loved to bird hunt. And, uh, and bird season in Alaska goes from August 15th of this year and runs all the way through to April 30th of the next year. And how many birds can you take every day? You can kill 20 of the state bird. I never lived in a place that ever let you do that before. 20 of the state bird, take them every day. And then you could also take 15 of one of the varieties or a combination of varieties of grouse. Every day. Every day. Talk about have a freezer full. One day we'd run out of meat. And I've t I think I've told you this. I, it was getting near dusk up there, snow on the ground. And I backed the car out. I look and there's a big old rough grouse right there in the tree. And man, I ease away from him. I go inside, get the dog and get my gun. I come outside. Sam sees the bird. Bird gets nervous. Fly. Boom. I shoot it. Sam goes and gets it. Brings it back to me. Retrieves it. I take it inside. Clean it. And we got fresh meat that night. Amen. I loved it, brother. I lived for it. And because of that, it controlled me. Time with family didn't mean anything. It was time with the dogs. Time with my buddies, who were also bird hunters. And we'd put a big bonfire out there in my yard as we approached August 15th, and we had, a, we had one of those traps, you know, a foot trap, and we just sit out there and bust clay pigeons all evening long till it got dark while the ladies were inside making all the wild game stuff from salmon and moose burgers, and we had all that. Why? Because everything was about August 15th, opening day. I remember one of the hunts I went on, three of us, and we killed 55 birds that day between the three of us, and had two six-month-old dogs, puppies still, sight-pointed, scent-pointed, backed each other up and retrieved all them birds as we hunted. Oh, I'm telling you, I had it bad. 
because I loved it, it controlled me. But when I got saved, those things changed. The Lord took them from me to help me, not to hurt me, not to disappoint me. Man, I moved away from Alaska. I sold the shotgun. I mean, I had a Browning side-by-side, double-barrel shotgun, Ithaca Model 37, Feather Light, had all the reloading things in my shot shells. And I had all that because I was in love with it. Now, you ask yourself, what is it that you love that controls you? You think about it. We don't want to be like those in Revelation 2. Remember the church at Ephesus? Now you're saying, Brother Ed, I thought you were going to encourage me. I'm trying to help you. I am. What happened to the church at Ephesus? Were, did, did they, did, were, were, they, were they busy about their father's business? If you think about it, man, they saw those that had wicked works. They saw those who were false prophets. Who are, they said they are apostles and they are not. They put them to the test. They were doing all these things. I mean, they were doing everything right. And he gets down there and, and what did he say? I know thy works. I know you've been doing this and I know you've been doing that and I know you've been faithful to do this and you've been doing that. And he said, but I have, I have somewhat against thee. You read in Revelation 2, you remember what it was? He said, you have left your first love. And what that simply means is they were going through the motions. It was business as usual. But their heart wasn't in it. Their love for the Savior was not where it was. They hadn't lost their first love. They just had left it. They'd kind of cooled in their relationship. Got a little careless in it. A little cold in their relationship. And so you ask yourself, so, so what is it that you love that controls you? How are things? We don't want to go through the motions without the passion to go with it. The desire. So, so is Christ really your all? Look, you're in chapter 3, look in verse 11. He said he's talking about this invisible church where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free. Now watch, but Christ is all and in all. That's, 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 that's where it's supposed to be. You know, and don't we sing that song? Christ is all I need. Christ is all I need. We sing it. We know the song. You probably could sing it by heart. But is your heart? What do we love? What drives you? What is it that drives you, that motivates you? Do you remember what Jesus said? Somebody, the disciples had come to feed Him and uh, He was there. He was with the woman at the well. Do you remember that in John chapter 4? And, and so what is it? the disciples had gone down to that Samaritan town and they weren't happy about going down there. You know, I mean, because what? Jews don't like Samaritans. They didn't have anything to do. And we had to go down there and get food. And they come back and, and, and they said, right, Master, here's the food. And he said, I have meat to eat that you know not of. And they're like, hey, who fed him while we were gone, you know? Because, I mean, they get a little miffed about that. And he said, I have meat to eat that you know not of. And what did he say? He said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work, John 4, 34. The motivation in, behind the Lord Jesus was his love for his Father and his love for the will of God to finish it. You ask yourself about that. Who or what dominates you? And when I ask that, what I mean by that is when it says set your affection on things above, that's really talking about your mind. You know, because here's really where the battlefield, isn't it? The things that our affections are, they're, they're up here. What, what, what's your thought life like? What is it that you think about the most? Who or what? Sometimes as men, man, we wake up in the morning and all we think about is I got bills. <laughs> and I got to earn enough today to pay the bills. Or I got to earn enough today to, you know, buy the groceries or, or fix what broke yesterday or whatever. And I know there's pressure on us, men. I know there is. And, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't get any, it doesn't go away, Brother Julio, when you get older. It doesn't go away. You, you know, you read, oh, we're on Social Security, and you find, hey, hey, hey we're, they're going to give us like a 3.5% raise. And then you find out that your Medicare went up about 3.5%. And, 
And, you know, so it's all a wash, usually. You get a little bit more, but then they want to tax you on the little bit more. It doesn't get easier, brother, as you get... I, I don't mean to disappoint you. It doesn't get easier when you... It doesn't go away, those things. But we can't let that be first and foremost on our minds. <clears throat> and, I th and I think, sister, I think about you, and I think about Sister Kendra, Sister Donna... Even about Brother Ed, he, he, those who are widows and widowers, I think about them because, you know, they still have needs that have to be met. I, I think about you all, and I pray about those things, you know, because, because of what happens, because there's really not somebody there to help look after you in those things. And that can become burdensome. But, we got, but you got to look up. And you can't let those things dominate your thinking. You know, and I, I don't want to give anything away, but it's kind of like the song that you were singing, sister. Had there not been this, I wouldn't have known that. Exactly. And so, how do we seek this? Who or what drives you? Ask that question. What is it that dominates your thought life? Where are your affections? And so, who or what directs you in what you're going to do? And, and why seek these things, number three. So we talked about what to seek and how to seek. But why, do, why should we seek these things? Look at verse four. When Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall you also appear with Him in glory. Man, you know, it is that song, what a day that will be, amen? There is a finish line. We are headed somewhere. You know, I, I like that song, you know, Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And thus surround the throne. And thus surround the throne. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Now, go back with me to the Old Testament one more time. Do you remember when Eliezer went out there to get a bride for Isaac? Man, he came with all those jewels and things, and that was the first thing that Laban noticed. Was everything that, you know, because those old schemers and, the, you know, they, they were pretty good at that, weren't they? Laban, yeah. And so Rebecca, you know, and man, he, he sees these things. And so, and so they say, well, you know, it's up to the girl what she wants to do. And she's looking at these things. And she said, yes, I will go with him. She hadn't seen Isaac. She never laid eyes on him. But she was just in, enjoying these blessings that were already here. And I don't think anybody here has ever had a vision of the Lord Jesus. I don't think you've seen Him in the flesh. But aren't we enjoying some of the bracelets and jewelry, the things that He has done for us? We are. And what, did Ellie, what do you think they talked about on the journey back where they were going? Do you, do you suppose, you know, you think about it, you're, you're kind of going like on a blind date, but it's going to be, I mean, you, it's not going to be a date. It's going to be the real deal. And she probably asked him, what does he look like? What color is his hair? And, 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 and are there more of these things? How, how many camels does he have? What, do, what does the tent look like where we're going to be? Can you imagine all the things that Eliezer said? Oh, my master's son. Oh, he's got these things and he's got that. And, 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 and man, I mean, over the course of that trip. I mean, ladies, I think about some of you. Oh, man, you know, if you're just going to go just a few miles from here, you have questions whenever you travel, don't you? Yes, you do. You know you do. Can you imagine what was on her mind? What, who, how old is he? Is he tall? What is, what is, is he handsome? And what are the servant? He didn't speak about himself. Eliezer there in the book of Genesis, or correction, in, in the book of Genesis is a picture of the Holy Spirit. There in Genesis 24, because you know what? The Holy Spirit doesn't speak about himself. Who does he do? He just presents Christ everywhere we go and everything we are. And what happened when they got to town? When they got there, what did they do? She looked out there and she saw someone coming towards them. 
And the Bible says, and she saw Isaac. And I think the next verse is she said, who is that man that's coming toward us? And buddy, she got off the camel, amen? <laughs> and he was out there for her, and he came to get her. And what did they do, man? They went back to the tent, and that tent flap closed, and that was the end of Isaac's sorrow over his mother, wasn't it? was. Can you imagine what our reunion is going to be? I've never seen him. I don't understand everything about it, but I just know it's going to be wonderful when we get to look upon him. Amen? Amen. This is why, this is why we look up, beloved. You're going to love. Didn't, didn't Paul say that? There's a crown for everyone who loves his appearing. I bet you she was glad for that camel trip to be over. Amen. And we ought to be looking for him like Rebecca of old who heard about him. It says, Rebecca lifted up her eyes when she saw Isaac. Oh, beloved, we have all these reasons to rejoice, to feed upon him for our journey, to let him dominate our thinking and our desires, our ambitions, to be nearer to him that way, you know, and listen to what the Holy Spirit shows you from the Word of God and let that soak in like it probably, I mean, there's no telling what was in Rebecca's imagination from the things that Eliezer had told her. I'm not trying to give light where the Bible doesn't. I'm just saying these were real people. She's a teenage girl going out there. Can you just imagine what that would be like? Well, our Isaac I don't think it's far away, do you? And so we need to focus our time on the things above, the things that matter most. Amen? Amen. Will you push the button for me there? Thank you.